Welcome to Peoples and Things, where we explore human life with technology. I'm Lee Vinsel. You know, like many professors, I do a lot of my thinking via teaching. Though this side of our work is not always as publicly visible as other parts, like publications. And when I start working with new graduate students, they often tell me they want to focus on digital technologies. And it's like, well, okay, do you have a good reason for wanting to do so? Or are you focusing on the topic because it's so faddish? Because you're rolling along with the tide? That's the first thing to figure out. And some students realize that they don't have a good reason, and they go on to work on something else. But of those that go on, a lot of them initially want to focus on the design of digital systems. And sometimes studying design makes sense. But science and technology studies has some legacies and traditions, like the idea that technologies have designed in politics, and the idea that we're, we should be studying the social construction of a technology, which almost always centers on the early stages of technologies, that keep the field way too focused on design. But I'm on the team that believes that if we really want to understand the impacts of technologies, we should focus on adoption and use of systems. If we want to think about the deep effects, for example, of information technologies, we have to examine how they have become a part of routines and ways of doing things in organizations. And if I'm teaching students about the adoption of information technologies, where should I send them? Well, mercifully, there are several well-developed literatures on this topic coming from multiple different academic disciplines and subfields. But one of my favorite books of all that I send students to is Joanne Yates' Control Through Communication, The Rise of System in American Management from 1989. It's the book that I first read in my first year of grad school and fell in love with. Control Through Communication examines the rise of communication systems. And here we're talking about things like typewriters and filing cabinets and card catalogs and memos and reports in modern corporations as managers sought ways to better understand and control the organizations they were responsible for. Joanne is also just a great and interesting person, and I use this opportunity as a chance to look back at the trajectory of her career, including how she went from being a literature PhD to eventually becoming Sloan Distinguished Professor of Management Emerita at the Sloan School of Management, which is MIT's business school. In my mind, this episode goes hand in hand with the earlier one featuring Ruth Schwartz Cowan, and hopefully there will be more episodes down the road revisiting technology studies classics. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Joanne. I learned a lot, and it's always so great to talk with her. Hey, get excited! Joanne, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, it was a pleasure. I, I'm looking forward to it. So, Professor Emerita, when, when did this happen? When did, it, when did you at least partly retire? Uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. It, so, okay. officially June 31st or 30th, I guess, um, 2020. Yeah. What um for me, you know, I usually start this um podcast by, you know, people I usually do newer books and then I have people explain them, but it was actually fun. I started with Ruth Cowan talking about more work for mother. Mm. And it's kind of fun to kind of go back uh, and look. So, for people in my generation, Control Through Communication is a real classic, and it's not a classic in the sense of something you just have to read. I think people actually enjoy and like it. So looking back at it from today, if you had to explain someone to someone today what it's about and what you were trying to do, what would you tell them? I guess I would say I was trying to understand how the communication and information system um, that dominated during most of the 20th century evolved starting in around 1880 um, and running to about 1820. It was the communication system that all of us 
um, who were my age, <laughs> at least, mm-hmm. were completely used to them. This is the pre-electronic mail, basically, mm-hmm. uh, and, and pre-computer communication system within businesses. And I was trying to understand how the, the ideologies of the time, the technologies of the time, um, and the genres of communication evolved uh, in, in, um, in relation to each other. Mm-hmm. And um, I think, it, well, first of all, I think anytime scholars see typewriters, filing cabinets, and card catalogs, they get excited. I, this is just something I've, I've found about scholars. I, I have friends I who buy card you, catalogs. You remember <laughs> that, you know, it still has some of these cool, I always liked the fact that the <laughs> Hopkins put the cool machines on the <laughs> cover. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so do I have this right that you wrote your dissertation on a completely different yeah. topic and came out of literature? Yeah. So what was your dissertation on? So I, I was in American literature and it was on sor- sources of terror in, a, in the American Gothic novel <laughs> before the Civil War. Um, uh-huh. So uh, the one thing that I've carried over from that through my whole career is the notion of genres uh, yeah. and how those evolve in relationship to other things, because what my dissertation was about how the American Gothic genre differed from the British one, and and essentially flipped the ideology uh, mm-hmm. in the process. So, but it was clearly when I was hired at MIT in 1980, I came out of my PhD in 1980, which was uh, a very bad year to get an English degree, uh-huh. <laughs> and um, I. I was interviewed by MIT to, for a job teaching technical writing, and I thought the interview went very well. But then they called back and said, well, look, we have two of you we like for that job, but we have this other job, and we haven't liked anyone we've talked to, and it's to start a communication program in a writing program for the business school, for the Sloan School of Management. Will you come back and talk to us again? And so I went back and talked to them again. <laughs> My <laughs> advisor, luckily, was not a typical English professor. He said, never do, turn down a job you haven't been offered. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Go back and talk to them. <laughs> um, and I took that job. Uh, and that meant that I was, I was on a tenure track in the School of Humanities at MIT in the writing program. But I was doing my teaching in the the School of Management in the Sloan School, uh-huh. and it was very clear to me that <laughs> writing on Gothicism <laughs> was not going to get me anywhere in the business school. Um, so I started thinking, okay, what can I do that would appeal to both sides of this? Uh-huh. And I was in uh, an English department at the University of North Carolina, where and this was before all the fancy theorizing just right before yeah. all that started to hit English. So we were a more historically oriented than, and new criticism and, and you know, very un, <laughs> untheoretical, yeah. basically. You weren't reading Derrida That's yet right. or anything. No, this was pre <laughs> that period. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it, the first thing that uh, occurred to me, the first thing that I thought I could actually do something about that might appeal – to both sides, was to study how the genres of communication, things like the memo and the report and things like that, uh, evolved in interaction with um, business history. I'd read by then I'd read Chandler, and thought, mm-hmm. ah, this is great. I can do something sort of within this um, framework uh-huh. in some ways. And so I, I, I thought, okay, I can focus on this communication system and how it evolved. And and I knew, of course, that there were technologies um, like the typewriter and the telegraph, although I will say that uh, vertical filing, um, no one talked about that yet. I was the one who kind of surfaced that cool. whole issue. And it, it turned out to be um, really fortuitous since... Um, the information technology, the IT people, that's what they really uh, grabbed onto very quickly yeah. at the Sun School. That was something <laughs> that, that they could um, relate to. Mm-hmm. And so there's a bunch of stuff I want to unpack in, in what you just said, which is totally fascinating to me. So 
Um, let's talk about genre for a second. How do you think about that concept and what work does it do for you? Yeah. Well, so the genre um, notion in English is about, you know, the novel versus poetry versus et cetera. But it was very quickly um, clear to me that you could easily import that into communication. So, mm -hmm. You know, a, a memo is a different genre than a letter is a different genre than a report. So yeah. that's how I started out. Um, the uh, I also, at a certain, well, uh, this will get us out of order a little bit, but... It, no, that's okay. Go for it. At, You're at, good. A, at a later point, right before a Control Through Communication came out, um, a... a someone in an English department or a writing program, Chuck Bazerman, who is a very famous um, person in his field, uh, came out with a book on, on um, the report, scientific report mm -hmm. genre and how it emerged in the 19th, 18th and 19th centuries. And mm -hmm. then he and another more theoretically minded person in rhetoric um, started working on this whole notion of... Um, genres being enacted social uh, a socially enacted construct not okay uh, a, a, not a template but a social something that you enact socially and in my later that's not so much the issue in control through communication i had not adopted that theoretical piece mm -hmm. yet because that was really coming into in the early 90s that sort of emerged and and that affected the second um direction I went with genre, which was my work with Vonda Orlikovsky. But in the er, in the control through communication, I was working with a relatively non-theoretical um, view of genre, a, a, yeah. a more common sense, you know, you recognize, you, you know, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it, yeah. <laughs> the, the kind of, I know a genre yeah. when I see one <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. um, notion of it. And Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things that happened on the, on the way to control through communication, I did research. Um, one of the companies I studied was at, at Harvard Business School's um, archive. Mm -hmm. And I, I, so I worked in there and in the stacks in, at Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. And the, the filing stuff, for example, jumped out at me on the shelf. I mean, I would not yes. have realized how important that was mm -hmm. until I saw shelf after shelf of books on filing. And it's like, why are these books down here? Yes. You know, it was in the very old materials. And <laughs> I was like, yeah. this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good, that's a good research strategy for young people to uh, remember, right? If you bump into something, it seems weird, maybe. Maybe it deserves attention. And it keep it kept popping up. I, I mean, I think yeah. the trick nowadays is to figure out how you do that using electronic access yes. rather than and then shelf <laughs> wandering yes. among the, the stacks. Because I wandered mm -hmm. among the stacks and I saw it there. And I saw, I was looking for books on, you know, the memo, writing the memo and things like that, but in mm -hmm. the same general section. Yeah. You know, I started running into stuff about filing. And, um, so either my second or third grade teacher uh, told something, uh, told me something that has left a big impression, has become one of my mottos, and that is, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me, <laughs> and I think that, so I, I, you know, because Chandler's like an important part of the framework of the book, and I know so many Chandler students, you know, I was trained by David Hounchel, who, you know, was, you know, Chandler was a mentor to him. I, Richard John, the historian, was also been a mentor to me, another Chandler student. So I just assumed you were a Chandler student, and that's when you know we started this conversation about you know your literature background and stuff. Do you remember when you discovered Chandler or how you discovered Chandler? Was it just in the air around there? Yeah. So that's a good question. I he was of course just across it the the river at Harvard right. Business School, <laughs> but I didn't hadn't. It, what, I didn't meet him immediately. It was a while before I met him, and I, I think, I think it was a well known enough that people mentioned it enough that I thought, okay, history, <laughs> I can, yeah, I can understand that, <laughs> and picked it up. 
and read it and mm-hmm. uh, first strategy instructor and then um, visible visible hand. hand yeah and yeah uh, the visible hand sort of became this. I went through a stage where it was this sort of Bible where, you know, anything you thought about studying, you could find that he said a few things about it somewhere in there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, It is a very idea-rich book in that. I mean, I think a lot of people find it dry, but actually there's, you know, there's so many ideas in that book. Yeah, And And, Yeah, go ahead. I think ultimately, you know, I, I have gone outside, somewhat outside that framework and... But, or or so deep within one piece of it that he never developed that yeah. I carved my own space ultimately. But it was it, that framework provided me a way of thinking that started me down this track, and it was incredibly valuable to me to yes. see to have a model. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I think that you know it became a real research paradigm in a way that it you know a lot of people worked within the framework in one mm-hmm. way or another or contested it as people have written about it. but i think you know so for readers who don't know this the visible hand it's about the rise of large corporations in the united states and um you know part of it is you know like david howenshill writes this R- book on the history of r&d at dupont but it's kind of in a chandlerian framework the question is like how does the r&d lab arise in these large right. firms and you're kind of doing something similar with communication. It's like, how do these large firms, as they're emerging, like deal with information, right? Yeah. Is that that's kind of yeah. how it was helpful yeah. to you? Is that fair? And going in yeah. much more detail, sort of in in a middle level, uh, not at the very top of the organization right. so much, and not at the very bottom like a, a, a David Noble, but in the middle and looking at the fine gradations of management and the and their interactions with each other and how the the communication how they started collecting information and pulling it up the hierarchy and doing using graphic techniques for example to compare mm-hmm. things and um, you know going into yeah. a much more <laughs> I, I mean, we would. Uh, I mean, it's a more material <laughs> mm-hmm. thing that I I did too with the the. I mean, we weren't talking about that. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. How does the management? How do the managerial systems that are developing actually come down to material culture? Right. Is something that yeah. you you really draw out? Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. So, I, you know, I also want to, so this, the, you know, in 1980, when you're hired at Sloan, there's this man, managerial communication curriculum. You, you, you didn't name it earlier, but you mentioned it. Was, what was the goal of this thing? What was it supposed to teach managers to do? How to write memos? Or, I mean, what's the, yeah. So the original idea um, came from a study that was done of uh, 10, co- of a a bunch of cohorts of graduates where a, a professor um, interviewed a whole set of alums at, on, yep. in cohorts at t- one year out, two year out, two years out, five years out, ten years out. Yep. And one of the things that emerged in those interviews was that uh, – and, and they were asked each time what was most useful that you learned at Sloan and what didn't yep. you learn that you wish you had learned and things like yep. that. And one of the things that emerged from that especially in the five and 10 year out people is that they felt they needed better writing skills. Um, yep. At that point, they were still sort of defining it more in terms of writing and, and they needed mm-hmm. to be able to communicate. You know, they got early on, they wanted to talk about the technical finance skills and things like that. But mm-hmm. but as they rose in the their organizations, they needed to be able to communicate to broader sets of people. Yep. So, so that was kind of the nudge that got them to hire for this position to start um, working on writing and then you know, within a few years, it was clear that oral presentation was um, a critical factor too. And huh, I, uh-huh. I added that. And then the curriculum grew over the years. It's a very elaborated and, and uh, you know, there's a group at Sloan that's big and that has, uh, that teaches a lot of classes and, and, mm-hmm. and both sort of a basic baseline core class that they all take, but all these electives and um, you know, social media <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, yeah. some things like that as well. So <laughs> cool. I love it. And, uh, 
Were there a lot of women around Sloan or in business history in that time? Mm. So, good question. And around Sloan, I was one of a, a very small set. And mm-hmm. we started meeting um, okay. in the very early 80s. And I am still involved with that, even though I'm retired. I'm currently organizing a get-together of the, the new junior faculty, <laughs> oh, that's so et cetera. Cool. So, you know, the, the women have... Um, were big supporters of me, of me. I mean, I was initially, as we will get to as we go further in the career, yeah. after three years on the tenure track in the School of Humanities, the the deans turned over in both of them, uh, both of the schools, and everyone said, this makes no sense to have her teaching in one place and on a tenure track in another. She needs to mm-hmm. go over to the business school and the business so Sloan said, fine, but we don't see this as a tenurable field. So they hired me. Um, they moved me over, doubled my salary. Um, uh, that sounds nice. Well, yeah. I started in 1980. with fi- My my salary was $15,500 oh a my year God. <laughs> in, the, in the writing program. So this, <laughs> it, it was easy enough to double. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, I was making more than that by the time I hit the, the point when I moved over. But anyway, sure. so they um, – but for seven years, I was a lecturer and then a senior lecturer. And then Control Through Communication came out and won a couple of awards and got a fair amount of attention. And And I started working with Vanda Orlikovsky on my, more, my contemporary work on electronic communication. Mm-hmm. And at that point, um, they agreed to uh, bring me back onto the tenure track and make me an associate professor without tenure. And then in four more years, I uh, got tenure. So it was the switch yeah. over was a um, a major inflection point for me. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like a real process too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, basically 14 years bef- uh, from when I came to when I was tenured. Wow. I was tenured in the spring of 94. So, yeah, it was a long time. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So, come back to your question again, will you? Yeah. I mean, the other thing was just, um, how about women in business Uh, history? Were there a lot of, yeah, yeah, were there a lot of women around? But let me go back for a minute and finish. I, I lost track of that thread there. Yeah. Um, During those 14 years, I got a good deal of support from the women faculty mm-hmm. all the way through. They, you know, they were my, there weren't very many of them, but they were my, they were my best supporters and also a few of the junior male faculty. The senior male faculty just didn't see um, what I did, communication, as being tenurable in a business school mm-hmm. um, at that point. But until... The book came out, and then they were impressed with that. That kind of mm-hmm. changed uh, what they were thinking about. But the women were a major point of support for me all the way through. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, That's there great. were a very small number, like four, and then, you know, it went up and down mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, it ranged. Now we have uh, almost – we have tw- – uh, uh, 25 plus or minus okay. half or something, which is yeah. the most we've ever had and is thrilling to me. But That's great. Um, at the time, you know, it was four and then it was six and then it was five and then, you know, it kind of yeah. rolled around in there and then it got to the point where it's 12 and then eventually under – at the same time that I got um, – I was moved to the tenure track and then ultimately got uh, – tenure, the, the dean that moved me back onto the tenure track had a commitment to bringing women on. And he uh-huh. he bumped women up in general. And uh, so soon after that, we reached this sort of plateau at 20, 20 to 22. And it sat at 20 to 22 for many, many years. Only, only in the last couple mm. of years have we reached 25. So okay. that's out of 100 plus, 100, wow. 10 to 15 yes. uh, it's still a very male-dominated space, then. Yeah, but uh, yeah. it's improving. <laughs> yes, and but how about business history conference? Yeah, Were there- so I found the business history conferences very welcoming, and although uh-huh. 
you know, there were more men than women. Uh, there were there were plenty of women who were. Uh, so Naomi Lamoureux, I became yes. friends with early on, and we used to room together in the uh, hotels at the conferences in the early mm-hmm. years. And and um, you know, there were a, a, a hand- Meg Graham, yeah, Meg, and and there were enough women who that I didn't feel isolated. And I actually mm-hmm. also found the the men at the business history conference much more welcoming than the men mm-hmm. in the business school at that point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, more mm-hmm. willing to see me as a possible peer than um, yes. than people in the business school uh, originally. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think business history conference has always been a very friendly <laughs> place. I, I find that too. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, you, you were starting to figure out this project and you realized, you know, you could you could do you could look at how the genres of communication developed in firms, how it's tied to, to technologies and such. How did you what research? How did you start down the road of doing research on this? Because that seems like I don't know if it would have been obvious right away. Yeah. Well, I sort of came up with a plan that I would have um, three or four companies that would be case studies. Mm hmm. But then I also was trying to figure out first what the lay of the land was in terms of the broader. Um, so, so my first case study I did was Scoville Manufacturing Company because the records were over at Baker Library. Yep. And I figured I wouldn't know what I was doing for a long time. And so it better be someplace I didn't have to travel to <laughs> mm-hmm. except for across the river. So um so I started doing that. I also started doing uh, reading around about the technologies and the um, looking at books um, from the stacks at, uh, there about mm-hmm. uh, writing business letters, writing reports, etc. Mm-hmm. I started looking at that stuff, and then. Um, these would have been like manuals, basically, right? Yeah, they were or little textbooks for yeah manuals and textbooks. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. and and you know there were lots of um, I, I I sort of was swimming around in it at first, not mm-hmm. not quite knowing <laughs> what I was doing, and it took me a while. Actually, my husband was uh, Craig Murphy was so helpful in letting me sort of talk this out to get to the point where I started to see what my framework was, which was that it wasn't really the technology that was driving the yes. um, the changes. Uh, it was enabling them. But the mm-hmm. th- thing that was driving and what uh, what I got more and more into was understanding the systematic management movement, the, the ideology yes. of systematic management. And it's... Um, its call for uh, gathering data, pulling data up a a hierarchy, and then comparing it up here and making decisions and then sending those decisions back down again. And in the period before 1880, for the most part, in most businesses that, and most of them weren't that big, um, you know, the, most of the communication was between the owner manager and and you know customers yeah. on out, outside so uh, as they started getting bigger uh, and you needed to have ways of communicating within them yep um that's when this stuff started emerging actually my the second case study that i did but the first one chronologically was a railroad because it was obvious to me that I needed a, mm-hmm. a, an early mover on this. So the Illinois Central, but its records were at the um, um, Newberry Library in in Chicago. So that that was going to require more of a <laughs> yes a trip and a commitment. So I started with the Scoville ones so I could spend more time and and just um, dive mm-hmm. into those archives and try to understand what was going on. I had a better idea than by the time I got to the railroad of, of mm-hmm. uh, how to look for things. Um, yeah, I, I was going to point there. Oh, go uh, of course, yeah. my third case study was at Hagley, was DuPont. So, um, mm-hmm. And that's well-trodden uh, area for many things, but not in, in mine. And of course, 
they are marvelously helpful at, at, the at Hagley's Hagley. awesome. It's just wonderful. Yeah. I spent, I loved my time there. So that was my yes. best experience in the archives. No, all young people doing historical business research to see if Hagley can uh-huh. have sources that'll help them for sure. Yeah, I was going to point to this uh, little section on uh, page 274 in the conclusion of your book where you kind of get at this um, anti- it's an kind of anti-determinist argument. So you write, recent innovations in computers and telecommunications have been so spectacular that contemporary commentators tend to focus solely on the technology, seeing it as the driving force causing changes in other parts of the organization. The case studies in this book, however, illustrate some of the problems with simple technological determinism. Technologies were adopted not necessarily when they were invented, but often when a shift or advance in managerial theory led managers to see an application for them. Well, that's exactly going along with what you just laid out. Yeah. And, you know, so for, for folks who aren't familiar with this kind of modern managerial, the managerial systematic management movement, like how do you understand that and where do you see that kind of merging? Yeah. So I differentiated, I adopted the approach that some people, a few people did. Most people focus on scientific management, which was the shop floor piece of things. Systematic management, I really focused in on the systematic management movement, which was the broader overall uh, movement of which scientific management was a part. And it included the office. And there's a lot of research, uh, excuse me, there's a lot written during that period. You know, if you look at the engineering, um, the ASME proceedings, the uh, uh-huh. uh, mechanical engineering proceedings, et cetera. There's all these articles about how to organize and how to do things in the office and how to make it more systematic and how yeah. to compare and, and um, you know, instead of just uh, playing by instinct, learning to gather data and make, I guess, <laughs> if I were writing now, maybe I'd talk about um, – the first analytics revolution. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But you know, before big data or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Way before, <laughs> but it's the sort of first little, uh, you know, the first uh, period where they said, "Okay, we've got to be more systematic about this. We've got to look at the data, and we've got to make." Yeah. Uh, so I was really focused on that broader systematic management movement, and. Mm-hmm. That was a distinction I kept having to make because the scientific management movement was very popular and everyone wanted to think in terms of Taylorism. But, yeah, you know, this was really the uh, not about <laughs> yes. uh, laying your bricks and things like that. It was about mm-hmm. how the managers ran the thing. And a lot of what I saw happening was that uh, there was this – need to understand that and and then there was kind of information overload an early version of information overload and, and then yeah. they had to learn better ways of working with it and organizing it mm. and how, how do you look at it in a way that's systematic enough that you can get something out of it yeah. and learn something about it so you know information overload <laughs> was also had an earlier incarnation so mm-hmm. um i yeah they be, one of the things that helped me with this, I think, was being in the business school. And actually, I think it's one of the things that has um, but made, uh, made my career way better than it would have been if I had been stayed in a school of humanities because I was mm-hmm. exposed to all these different fields. And the one that mm. information technology had a big impact on yeah. me. Um, and, you know, the stuff I would hear about it. And of course it was a very hot topic. So I, I, I learned yeah. a lot about it. And I, um, towards the end of the eighties, when just as this came out, I was, uh, I gave talks on, on this book to people mm-hmm. in the, um, information technology. Oops, information yeah. technology group, and they were very interested in the technology piece of it. So, mm-hmm. you know, all of this was 
uh, affecting my viewpoint on it. I, I think it was enormously, you, for me, the interdisciplinarity of the space I was sitting in <laughs> yes. um, was, uh, was hugely generative and, and hugely mm-hmm. valuable. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I am a, you know, I am a big fan of business schools for the d- interdisciplinary thinking. You know, I like K- Kirsch and Goldfarb and Meg Graham and all these people who landed in these business schools. It's just so much interesting thinking happens in these spaces. Yeah, there's just so many ways to approach things that it, and, you know, it gives you uh, new hooks into historical yeah. work as well. Yeah, so I was, you know, I, I think of your... I think of it's interesting hearing you kind of talk about the origins of the book because I associate it, I, and it's probably because reading it backwards, <laughs> you know, in time, and also seeing that you know your work with Orlikowski, which we'll talk about more in a second. You kind of started working on information in, in digital technologies, right? Mm-hmm. And so I always assumed that it was just part of that thing happening in the 80s. But it sounds like it started from somewhere else, but the ICT stuff came in as it was evolving yeah. or something. Is that uh, right? It started from somewhere completely different. Yeah. And the point when the two started, I was getting a few ideas that were in the air as I went along. But I, where they really started converging was when uh, – Vanda Orlikovsky and I started working together at the end of the 80s because okay. she was quite interested, as were other, I mean, Tom Malone as well. Um, they were quite interested in this, and I did um, collaborate with uh, a few other people initially uh, in the mm-hmm. information technology area to provide some historical background on telegraph and, and things like that. So, yeah. um, you know, there was interest in that, but then the deep dive came with Vanda and the, and the yeah, okay. contemporary communication technology, but there was a recognition by a broader set of people in that group that, what I was working on was related in some way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they saw it as, this is interesting. There's, I, we see connections. All right, good. Well, we're going to come back to this in a second. So, um, you know, how do you, when you looked at these three firms, so you got Illinois Central Railroad, Scoville, this manufacturing firm, and then DuPont, which DuPont's a very important Chandlerian company. <laughs> you know, like it's it, it's looked at for a reason, um, right? It, and so what is the evolu- – the, what's the historical argument here? What's the evolution you see between these three companies? Yeah. Well, in, in some ways I was trying to look at the – take each of the three and compare in those three how it evolved. And in the railroad, you know, this is an earlier stage and it, it you know, it, it was uh, was more of a um, – let me pause for one second. And pick, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick my book back up. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when I talked about the uh, Illinois Central, I had to look at, you know, improved statistical reporting yeah. was important to them eventually. They, yep. they learned how to do... Um, how to start gathering some data across their lines and and doing mm-hmm. it but it was very slow progress and it yeah. was it didn't come as far in a way um mm-hmm. because there wasn't there wasn't a you know I didn't look at uh, the Illinois Central Central office as much mm-hmm. as stuff that was, I mean, most of their offices were <laughs> along the railroads. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so it was, it was, uh, it was. So they were starting to do it, but they hadn't really perfected it. Yeah, yet. I think that's right. It, it was, I mean, I, one of the later heads of it, Fish, uh, did do more and, and started mm-hmm. to, dive into it more but actually frankly it's been so long since i've read my chapter on (laughs) the illinois central that i can't even remember the details in scoville um it was more it was easier to follow in one way because um the the records themselves 
change. Mm -hmm. Well, this was true in both of them. One of the things I learned uh -huh. is look at the physical form of the of the the series that you get in a um, an archive, and the physical yes. form changes tended to signal genre changes as well. Yes, and so mm -hmm. I, I I guess I first and changes in thinking, right? Yeah, and I first yeah. saw that in I guess in the uh, the Scoville because I did mm -hmm. it. <laughs> it was the first one I did. <laughs> right. So the fact that I did them in a different order means I didn't think of them. Uh, as much as evolving across the three companies, uh, as much as evolving in different ways. I think the most mm -hmm. interesting one, I mean, it was very gradual at Scoville, and you could trace it very uh, clearly. The most interesting one was DuPont because it was discontinuous there. It was a, it was a step yes. function there because mm -hmm. in 1902, when um, you know, the oldest uh, – one of the old DuPonts di died off, and then um, Pierre S. DuPont and his cousins uh, were the new generation, and they had been working elsewhere, and they had learned about systematic management. And so they, mm -hmm. when they came in, they imported this notion. So there's a very um, clear point at which all yep. these ideas you know, there had been tiny bits of evolution before, but not much. And then there's the yep. just big <laughs> change. And you can really see it um, yep. in it. So it was, that was quite different from Scoville. I think Scoville was very continuous. And 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 that was not the case with DuPont. Mm -hmm. So, um, And you could also see some resistance to it in DuPont because mm -hmm. it was more – like they started – they – had bought up all these dynamite um, companies. So they had lots of... Literally dynamite, not just a blockbuster. Yeah. No, not blockbuster. Yeah. Literally <laughs> dynamite. And they yeah. they had... Uh, so they had all these different pla dynamite plants all, all over the yep. northeast and... Or the east. And so they started asking, you know, they started sending out these... Um, messages to them and saying, you know, we want to report on this and then mm -hmm. we want to report on this every month and that every week and this and that. And so mm -hmm. um, you could see that the the plant manager and then they started getting the plant managers together on annual, semi-annual mm -hmm. and then annual meetings. So, um, but you could see that they chafed a bit under under mm -hmm. this and, you know, there were these cartoons where they have the superintendent grinding this um, machine and all these uh, messages coming out of it saying to do this, do that, do that. So that you could see that, you know, they were um, a little Yeah, bit... wasn't it happy for everybody exactly? Yeah, but yeah. I mean, it's part of what made me feel that it's part of what made very clear to me um, that views of the workplace in which you see the, the fight is labor against management, ignore all these layers of management and all mm -hmm. the the things going on within those, you know. Yeah, intra-managerial tensions of various sorts, mm -hmm. yeah. And different Unit levels, tensions. yeah, absolutely. Yep. I mean, and it, it really made me throw out the window in my own thinking. Um, yeah, the, the simplistic yeah. breakdown, the labor management breakdown. I was like, yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's all these layers in management. They're all they all have different ideas and thoughts and mm -hmm. um, and what I'm interests. Yeah. yeah, and what I'm interested in is somewhere in there, not not necessarily one simple divide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, Dupont. You know, there's a reason historians looked at Dupont a lot during that period because there really was a switch, and you mm -hmm. really see a new thing come on. But they really took it pretty far. So. Um, I'm going to talk about my buddy Erica Robles Anderson more in a minute here, but she she really likes the Dupont chart room mm. photo, which is on page 267. Yes, one of my so, favorites. Yeah, had anyone had anyone written about that? How'd you find it? And well, maybe you should say what it is first. Yeah, the chart room is this incredible um, uh, operation they set up at Dupont where they had. Um, big charts hanging from the ceiling, from these tracks on the ceiling, and you could pull different ones in front of them. Mm. Um, I don't know if this would be seeable or not, but there is a picture of the room. Yeah. 
<laughs> and you know those different charts could be pulled in front of them and yeah. um they they had a uh, a set of them so these were for the highest up in the company and they had a set of them that um they considered key and that they monitored you know it's like having a dashboard this was their equivalent <laughs> of a dashboard mm -hmm. um, in a way. And they, and that, where did I run into it initially? I can't remember where I first, um, maybe one of the archivists mentioned it to me or something. I, I actually yeah. don't remember. But yeah, that's how it works. Once I saw, I mean, I was doing a section on um, use of graphs and charts as a, a, a genre in there, but also they had that, the Donaldson Brown re ROI, return on investment um, formula that they were using at that point. And as you broke that down, each of the things that fed into that formula was charted on one of these charts. And the, your book won a, a couple awards. And I wonder just, yeah, I wonder what, what you think the you know the committees that gave you the awards uh, saw yeah so in one, the book it, it depends on the um, so the awards were not in business history the awards were in one of them was from the archival society and the archivists uh -huh. absolutely loved it I'm sure they did yeah because it, they saw this as a book that explained lots about what they the materials that they were using. So sure. and that they organized. So it they 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 felt that they learned a lot from it. They felt that it was really focusing on something that they cared about, and you know, it, for them, it was uh, a no brainer <laughs> in a way yes. that this was. Yeah, they really liked it. And then the community. They're your people. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I wasn't an archivist and never have been, but uh, you know, yeah. it, and I I did write a paper for them for one of their journals after this. But you know, they were really into this. Um, the other award was from a communication, um, a business okay. communication group. And uh, at that point, and, and still to some extent, business communication is not a, um, a, a field with – I mean, the reason <laughs> the Sloan School wouldn't see um, business communication as a tenurable field is that the literature wasn't good enough. I mean, there wasn't mm -hmm. enough – sophisticated enough uh, research that went on yeah. in that field. But for them, uh, they really thought that, that this was, um, they really thought it was great for a different reason than the archivist, that, but this was something that was real research that they uh -huh. could understand and was clearly rigorous, but it wasn't quantitative and therefore mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they could read it and understand it and thought, wow, this is great. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was. And then, I mean, from business history, I didn't get any awards at the time, although my, I got the um, uh, mid-career award mm -hmm. a few years later based primarily on the book. So got it. the book mm -hmm. itself didn't win the award, but the mid-career award, uh, I think, was based. <laughs> got it significantly yeah, on it so they i think it it gained um attention from them maybe it wasn't instant but uh, mm -hmm. uh but it grew on them <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it grew on actually the other interesting audience that still uh uses it uh, information schools uh, yes of course yeah yeah so i have some questions from uh Fans, mm -hmm. I, I put it out on Twitter, as I told you, just saying <laughs> we we're going to talk today. And I've never done that before, but I'll do it. I got four four questions. These are kind of – we're going to go back to your career here in a second, but these are questions from other folks. Um, so my friend Erica Robles Anderson, who's at NYU, and we were on a panel with her last year or something like that. Uh, she says, I love this book and your work, your body of work more broadly. I'd love to hear your thoughts about how we might study organizations and their genres with kind of new AI authored documents in the mix. So that, this is connecting to your later stuff. Ooh, AI authored. Ooh. <laughs> 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 well, 
Well, so that's really interesting because if, if AI authored it, it's not social action. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. that is a real theoretical uh, problem. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's a tricky issue. If AI is, I mean, I have no trouble carrying the notion of genres <clears throat> into electronic communication. Yeah. I don't think email is a genre. I think people uh, um, import different genres into yep. email and email is a medium. So, it, you know, mm -hmm. I separate it that way and I have no trouble talking about the genres and electronic media. But yep. when AI gets into it and it's not a socially enacted uh, mm. kind of thing, that that poses real problems for genre theory because genre theory is all mm. around social enactment. The rhetorical genre mm. theory has really, um, you know, exploded. It, it, it's not something that business historians look at. It's not something that, I mean, it's sort of off there in another mm -hmm. field, but I have been very aware of it because I've known some of the people in it. And, yeah. and, and it's become a very big field, but it's all about social enactment, um, not, yes. not about... Uh, so, so the notion that an AI can uh, um, generate yeah. what looks like an instantiation of a genre is very dis distressing. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think a couple of thoughts I'm having right now is, first of all, I think we know that like chat GPT and these other things actually – uh, the documents they split out, spit out are kind of very cliche because of how they've learned yeah. from other writing. So actually, they, they follow genre pretty closely, and, and you can actually cue them to do... Yeah. So the form aspects of it, they certainly follow closely. Yeah. 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 And... and uh, oh, go ahead. No, go, go on. No, I think the other thing is just... I mean, I think there's, a, there's just a question where we'll have to wait because the real question is how do we start using these in practices in organizations. So some people are saying, oh, we're going to use them to do first drafts and then we'll edit and revise. Hmm. But I mean, that's the kind of stuff, you know, I think in terms of communication technology, we're going to really have to see how it shakes out. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, in some ways I feel like I retired at just the right time <laughs> in 2020. Um, I missed the worst of the pandemic teaching and uh, <laughs> And this new AI stuff, it's like, oh, my God. Ah. Um, sorry. That <laughs> but, <clears throat> I mean, we do have to see. One of the things that happens with genres that people enact in organizations is that yeah. as situations change, um, gradually people enact things somewhat differently and, and genres yeah, change. change. What, yeah. what happens – with AI on this? Do they just lock in? All they can do, I think, is spit out existing ones. Yeah. Um, so I don't think yeah. there'll be the kind of evolution uh, that there was. So that's a, an interesting, that's interesting issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, yeah, there can't be, I don't think AI can generate new genres. So it would freeze... Yeah. Uh, the genres in time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you hear. I think you hear. Uh, you know, some critics of the way we're using automated technologies say things like this that it's actually locking us into yeah uh, to certain ways of doing things, and it doesn't think in the way that humans do. So that's right, that, and that's how we move. And it doesn't have purpose. I mean, I, right. I guess the socially enacted thing is about you having a purpose. Yeah. Um and. That's it, it. Lacks. <laughs> you can it can imitate it, but it doesn't have its own purposes, and so it can't. Yeah. Develop new totally. ways. Totally. Uh, here's another one. This is from Dan Green, who I think is in the Information School at University of Maryland. He's definitely at University of Maryland. He said, "I love this book, and would love to hear any thoughts she has on the macroeconomic context for these organization changes." It feels like her objects of study were important to the corporate recovery after the 1870s depression and a century later computerization may have done the same. So I wonder about that. I mean, like, you know, like, do you think the economic context was driving some of these changes in thinking and desires to improve things? Yeah, I'm sure the economic context was, I think. But so I didn't know much about the 1887 <laughs> panic or anything like that, that mm -hmm. when I was doing this. So I was, um, 
I, I certainly didn't see, at the time see that as as involved, but I, I think there was this sense that they needed to be. So we had diseconomies of scale, as, yes. as as companies got bigger in the 1880s and 1890s, there were diseconomies of scale rather than economies of scale. They didn't think of it that way, but I think there was a recognition that it, it was it was not, they weren't getting better results, <laughs> like yes. as they grew. So, and and it was getting uh, more and more messy. So yes, it was a reaction to that. It's like you know we should be making more <laughs> we should yes. be doing better and i think the uh, diseconomies of scale were a big piece yeah. of that in the manufacturing arena particularly and and as the you know the railroads grew and too you know you diseconomies of scale are a really bad sign right mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you're not supposed to have that and um I think that probably did nudge it along, and it's a good question. I mm-hmm. hadn't thought about that, but um, and what did it, what was his contemporary one? The oh, just I think computerization after the seventies. I mean, you know, like I think the way we see. Mm. Well, I mean, but you know, your 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 other book we're going to talk about is, uh, I mean, the the life insurance book. There was already computerization in the sixties yeah. going on, yeah, fifties, obviously. So yeah. yeah, I I think also in the in the um period of in the 80s I, I mean it was it took a long time for computers to become uh, a positive force in in the productivity you know for a long yes. time they didn't improve productivity there was this long yes. lag as people had to learn how to use them and and you know it 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 was much more difficult than anyone thought it was going to be. Yes. And, you know, software. Oh my God. Yes. Who knew they had to do software? <laughs> yeah. yeah, or maintain it or anything. Yeah. Uh, exactly. <laughs> you know, all kinds of things that um, yeah. were big problems. So uh, I think in uh, that may have driven. I think desires to cut costs certainly mm. drove a lot of adoption, but. You know what you want is not just to cut costs, <clears throat> and it didn't cut costs. It it mm-hmm. shifted them to different parts of the organization. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is actually on the efficiency question. So, this is from Chad Wellman, who's a professor at UVA. He said, broad and abstract, but I think Yates could help me, and I imagine others interested as well. Uh, think about how. We today can understand legitimate critiques of, say, progressive roots of early management and efficiency cultures and more contemporary reactionary attacks on governing and institutions. So this is a big question, but I see it as, you know, like earlier, you know, like w- there's this efficiency movement, which your your systematic managers are yeah. very caught up into how to make things more mm-hmm. efficient and productive. And there's critiques of that, right? I mean, and there's pushback yep. against yep. it. That versus, you know, I don't know, neoliberal and right wing attacks on like governance and institutions and stuff. I think. Yeah. So, so, so let me say, I'm going to have to bring in the standards work on this because I think yeah. that's where I'm most um, running into this. I mean, certainly it's the case that the standardizers are trying to uh, improve engineering efficiency by having interoperability and all kinds of things like that. And I think they did see themselves as a positive force, Mm -hmm. um, a progressive force. And I think for the most part, they were a progressive Mm -hmm. force during much of this period because they made it possible um, to, to bring prices down and, and to make consumer goods a lot less expensive and to make, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Overall, I think standards actually benefited users hugely. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, we wouldn't have the, the technological world we have today without them. But they were operating out of a, a sort of what they saw as a progressive engineering um, yes. culture. And, mm-hmm. and certainly this other thing was a progressive engineering movement, too. I, I, you yeah. know, I think... <sighs> I think engineers didn't believe in profit for profit's sake so much. They believed in efficiency, but not, you know, they, you know, they, 
their ideology wanted things to be efficient and effective, but not necessarily to make the most money for the owners. Or, or, mm-hmm. you know, so. It was about more than that, for sure, yeah. 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 Um, and no. Yeah, I think it's... I mean, we, I think we know there's like there were critiques of these early efficiency movement, and people felt, you know, they were chafed at it. And I think you can see it because like Herbert Hoover, I read about this in mm. moving my moving violations. Herbert Hoover stands up for standards as like yep. being masculine. Yeah, you know, like you know, they're, they're like they're tough and manly. They're not like whatever you're casting them as. So, well, you know. I have to say that unfortunately, most of the standardizers were men. I mean, it was a very yeah. male dominated area. <laughs> but I, I don't think standards are manly. In fact, uh, the thing that had to, in his sense, um, the thing that um, standardizers had to have to be successful at it is a, a great. Uh, ability to be diplomatic and to negotiate and yeah. you know the people the the uh, you know the standardizers uh, um, uh, who were most successful and who had long careers in it were knew how mm-hmm. to face themselves and how to you know be diplomatic and how to mm-hmm. bring people along and so it really mm-hmm. it, it wasn't quite the the manly thing that Hoover had in mind I think <laughs> um, yeah in some ways I, I mean it's sort of ironic that so few women were that there were no women in in standards that we could find um, until mm-hmm. until you know, the second half of the 20th century. Um, Mm -hmm. But. (laughs) So this, this question is really out of, uh, out of chronological order. um, But we're going to hop back into chronology here in a second, but it's from Richard John. And he uh, is historian at Columbia (laughs) journalism school. And he had a question, uh, I guess in the early 2000s, he proposed turning the name of the Business History Conference to the Society for the History of Capitalism, or SHOCK. And he said that you uh, <laughs> you you resisted this and wanted to keep Business History Conference, and he wanted it if you if you had any ideas why, or do you remember why? No, I don't even remember the discussion, but I will say <laughs> uh, calling us shock troopers <laughs> its a little weird. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be a shock trooper. Um, I, I have to admit yeah. that I'm not fond of the capitalism rhetoric, but uh-huh. I, I agree that business is also um, – problematic in certain ways too i probably yes. resisted it just because business history conference had been so uh, so much a home for me that the uh, uh, and i you know business is something concrete that you understand mm-hmm. capitalism is this is this sort of more abstract notion and yeah. i guess i'm a I, i'm a concrete person i i've always been in all my work i've been the empirical person, not the theoretical person. You mm-hmm. know? Um, yeah. Materiality. <laughs> and, you know, I want yeah. the, uh, you know, so to me, business is more concrete than capitalism. Yeah. And capitalism is such a big concept that I'm not sure where the boundaries are, you know, what it yeah. is and what isn't it. And, you know. Well, it's been a big problem for the so-called new history of capitalism. That's right. Actually, I think they've really struggled in that way. Well, I, I wonder too. I mean, you know, uh, so often in other historical subfields or in like STS, an area I work in, when business, when capitalism comes up, it's just a auto assumed to be a negative. When business comes up, it's assumed to be a kind of negative thing, even though there's not a lot of mm-hmm. study of business. It's just like kind of black box, right. but assumed to be re- negative. And I just, I mean, like, I guess because, you know, partly because BHC has been, you know, there's so many people are a part of business schools and it where it's kind of generated from. There's not that assumption. Yeah. And in fact, there's like, you know, right. you have to treat business people in a kind of, mm-hmm. I don't know, more generous way, I yeah. think. So I so let, let me say something about that, because it's something I feel yeah. very strongly about. I feel that mm-hmm. the... The, the human world of humanities in which I grew up had that black boxing and bad yes. notion about business capitalism, and all of that stuff. And, I, you know, I had it too. I, I wasn't sure I should even – I was perfectly happy to talk to MIT about teaching technical writing, but the idea of teaching business writing was like, hmm, do I want yeah. to even uh, do this? And my 
advisor had to tell me, don't turn it down until you <laughs> talk to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I've learned and what has benefited me enormously um, in, in many ways in my research and elsewhere, that that black box is really uh, um, simplistic and, and um, mm-hmm. not very useful. And, and mm-hmm. even if you take the black box around the business school – and open those that up, and wow, there's so many different people who come at it from so many different angles. You know, I have uh, colleagues, John Van Manen, who was an ethnographer who did ride-alongs with cops and stuff, mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, is it, it, in a business school. And you know, all these people who are very uh, liberal. I think um, I only yeah. know of one person. I, there may be more, and this person was in accounting, but I only know of one person at, at Sloan who supported Trump. You know? Right. Um, it fixtures that it was accounting, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, certainly all the people in the areas that were around, you know, the organizational areas and the yeah. that were, were, you know, completely opposed. So, right, you know, right. it's not this... Uh, I mean, I'm sure it varies from business school to business school. The ones with more finance are probably more, um, yeah, are different. Um, but uh, uh, there's always, I don't know any major business school that doesn't have people who are on um, what people in the humanities would see as the right side. Um, right. So, so seeing it all as one, you know, as a block of, of accountants is yeah. <laughs> it's really a mistake, I think. Um, I just think it gets in the way of our understanding. So absolutely. Deeply, you know, absolutely. You know, I have uh, just found yeah. it such a generative area for interdisciplinarity and, and um, you know, yeah. it, it, it hasn't, it hasn't, I think, made my, it's only reinforced my politics, but it, um, and my, my, liberal politics but but it doesn't it's you know it, it hasn't turned me into a <laughs> trumpist or something yeah no no I, I, I just think like you know i hear people giving presentations on like biotech or whatever and the the business side of it gets black box i'm like well what's the market size how many yeah. firms are in it yeah. you know they have never looked because they don't know how to think about the businesses where this stuff is happening. So yeah. I think well, it, you can't understand gets... the entrepreneurial world of biotech and and things like that without having some understanding of the financial side of it. You know, people who yeah. do who start these new companies have to know what the potential market size is. Yeah, exactly. Um, and oh. you know, that's not my area, but but you have to have it's them around. Yes. So I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you a bit about your work with Vonda Orlikowski. But I mean, the way I want to get into it is that, you know, uh, so when I start the, my podcast is called Peoples and Things. I taught a class at, at Stevens called Peoples and Things, and what I tried to do there was take a very interdisciplinary, literally look at all these different business uh, dif- disciplines, including business schools as one hub, how they think about these different topics. And when I was thinking about communication and the adoption of communications technologies, thinking about your book, I bumped into this other person called Joanne Yates, who had written all this stuff. No, it's not literally true. I, I, I figured it was you immediately, right? But it was like, you had this history side of your career. And then you had like this side of your career uh, that is facing towards business journals and, mm-hmm. and stuff like this. And I, I wrote you about it kind of during that period and kind of joked about it. And you're like, well, that's true of my career in general. Like people often know of one side of it, but not the other. Right. So talk about that. I mean, how yeah. did it develop? And yeah. yeah. Well, so after I, after Control Through Communication came out and I, uh, and after I had given a talk at the, in, to the information technology folks and she was one of them and uh, she was fascinated by it and we decided to collaborate on a um a paper and it was funny because it started uh, it, it it evolved enormously in the in the process mm-hmm. of it the the reviewing cycle in management journals is unbelievable compared to i mean people oh, in yeah. business history oh would God. not recognize it <laughs> um so it goes through these incredible <laughs> yeah. review cycles you know getting eight 12 pages of reviews back and, and having mm-hmm. to respond to all of them back to them. And it really made us rethink it. And what came out of that um, 
that first paper was that uh, genre uh, bumped up into the um, center of it, and we used uh, the memo as an example and showed how it evolved to show how genre was a structure in the sense of Giddens' structuration theory, which is her mm-hmm. her overarching theoretical framework, and hmm. um, we used then the 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 memo in the the middle of the the paper is taking the story of the memo from the book and 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 putting it into um, this theory and creating diagrams of how it worked and what happened mm-hmm. at each point and and um, and it got published in the Academy of Management Review. So we said, okay, right. we, we have this nice <laughs> theory. So now we need to apply it to something empirical, <laughs> mm-hmm. and we needed some. Uh, we wanted to uh, apply it to some electronic mail. And remember, mm-hmm. this is still end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. So we uh, – and, and we thought about getting emails from within companies. But then mm-hmm. we realized we were going to have a real fight with um, the Institutional Review Board uh, mm-hmm. to get hold of individual – all of the email by some set of individuals uh, right. within an organization. That that, that, that was going to be very difficult. So we started – with a set of emails that had been made public. And that mm. was um, the Common Lisp project. Lisp was an AI language um, hmm. that was uh, widely used back then. And the Defense Department, the U.S. Defense Department, had, had um, you know, supported a lot of projects using Lisp at a lot of different locations. And one of the things that had happened is all these dialects of Lisp had come out. And mm-hmm. so there, there were different dialects and they were becoming increasingly incompatible. So you couldn't port things from one uh, computer to another um, because they had different kinds of Lisp in them. And so the Defense Department sort of issued an ultimatum one day and said, okay, you guys have to negotiate a common Lisp because we're not going to fund mm-hmm. any more projects using Lisp until you do it. And so the, there's a set of people, some of them were academics, some of them were at AI companies, they were all over the country, um, and they suddenly had this task that they had to complete <laughs> to be able to go mm-hmm. on with their other work. So, mm-hmm. and they, um, so it was, it was an early standards, uh, standards effort, actually, <laughs> as okay. it turns out, but not within a standards organization, just among themselves. Yeah. And they made this whole set of emails public after they finished. That makes sense. Because yeah. they wanted people to know how they got there. So we took that yeah. set of 2000, and they did almost no phone calling um, hmm. on it. They did it almost all on email. Um, and we interviewed some people as well as analyzing over 2000 messages. We hand coded them. <laughs> this was, yeah. you know, back in the hand coding days. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and we looked at the genres that it emerged in them and how, uh, what genres they used and how they changed. And we uh, saw, you know, everything from sort of the, the most bland version that, that we call the memo, but also the proposal, the, the ballot, they had the balloting genre system where, mm-hmm. you know, they'd send out a set of questions, they'd all have to vote on them and make comments on them and then those would get compiled and they'd go back out which is very like the genre system actually in standards which i've looked at as well Mm -hmm. um and in organ standardization in the more formal organizational context um so you know we had all that uh, data and we used it and we went (laughs) we aimed high (laughs) i don't know that i would have done this on my own but uh, vonda wanted it to go for asq administrative science quarterly which is the top uh, management journal in in general management and so Mm -hmm. it went through an unbelievable (laughs) process of review and it got stuck at a certain point because there were two sets of reviewers and um, one set just was not interested at all. They just mm-hmm. thought mm-hmm. nothing. And the other people, the other set thought, well, this does have potential. And, mm-hmm. you know, we did our first round of revisions and mm-hmm. and the, the people who didn't like it still didn't like it. The people who liked it, liked it better. We're, we're, we're 
say, okay, this is going in the right direction. Let's do one more round and see where mm-hmm. we go. And then, and <clears throat> it was a long, gory story, but it took <laughs> years. Um, because one, there was a change in the editor in chief at that journal during mm-hmm. this time too, and the the one editor just wouldn't break the logjam. He just was not mm. willing to make the call and uh-huh. say either no or yes. So mm-hmm. it wasn't until the new um, editor came on that uh, Steve Barley that he oh right <laughs> indeed, and he he. It, and he didn't just make the call. He went in and he wrote his own. He added his own eight pages on top of the other eight nice. pages in another round of reviews. So we had 16 pages of things to respond to. But <clears throat> And when we did all that, <clears throat> he accepted it. So, nice. you know, it was a, nice. a long and gory process, but <laughs> <laughs> it finally got there. <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> and then and following you that, we did other work together as well. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, then I- you, um, eventually wrote Structuring the Information Age, Life Insurance, and the mm. Technology in the 20th Century, which is the first time I don't know if I actually met you there, but it was the first time I saw you in action because I went to that. Hagley held a little event in it, uh, around it. Mm-hmm. I think Steve Usselman was there. Yeah. Maybe Naomi Lamro was on the panel. And they had a little panel around it. Um, mm-hmm. So how did you end up? I mean, did your did that end up coming out of your work with Orlikowski? Because that's about computers and yeah. the life uh, insurance. Well, yeah. so um, it came out of both sides. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the thing that came out of uh, Vonda's side is the uh, um, the structuration framework that I used in it, mm-hmm. but the. I had wanted to do something bringing the technology up farther. I knew that mm-hmm. um, I hadn't dealt in control through communication with um, punch card tabulating, and I was interested in that. And mm-hmm. So I thought, okay, that's something interesting I could work on. And I decided what I really needed to do is to take a user industry and focus on a, a an industry that used – this kind of equipment and look at how they made the transition from that technology to the computer technology and to see whether mm-hmm. it was as much of a break as we think of it as. Yep. <clears throat> and I picked life insurance just because it seemed to me there were two obvious choices, banking and life insurance that were extraordinarily heavy users of information technology. Yep. And yep. I knew some people had done work on banking already. And Mm -hmm. it wasn't that I was um, enamored of life insurance. I just seemed like that was the better one to pick. And as with all my um, work, I tend to take topics and areas that sound really boring to everyone. And (laughs) and, you and me both. Yeah. And then find (laughs) something that I really get excited about in it. Yeah. One thing that had become very clear to me from being in a business school setting was yeah. that users were really important. Um, mm-hmm. That you can't just focus on a technology and ignore <laughs> the people who use it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and there certainly were people in a business school who did just focus on the technology, but then there was another set who focused on the use and right. technology use and technology in practice. Technology. Yes. <laughs> and that uh, sort of said to me, okay, let's focus on a user. And that's why um, I chose a user industry. And it it turned out that insurance was a good one. There there were archives available. And Mm -hmm. um, there were a few, I did a few interviews, but mostly I depended on archives again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, MetLife had archives and, you know, in some cases, um, I got documents just from people who at companies who didn't have archives. But yeah. um, I, I, as I got into this, I, I discovered that the choice of, of insurance had been fortuitous in the sense that the a lot of the people in insurance were very involved in the the last phases of of the. Uh, uh, developing computers that that would go yes, out exactly. to to commerce. So 
Yes. You know, they were very involved in that, actually. So mm -hmm. it, it was definitely um, a more appropriate <laughs> a choice of industries than I had assumed in the first place. So I was very glad right. I had chosen it. And the early engagement, the amount of engagement between um, insurance people and the computer industry was just huge. They, they, you know, yeah. they, they funded the development of the um, Univac. <clears throat> they, I, I consider them, um, along with some other companies, basically as having helped or, or made it possible for IBM to survive that, that technological divide. Because, you know, IBM was behind Univac in the in the fancy um, upper what was then the upper end of computers, but yeah. it turned out that insurance wanted things that looked a lot like tabulators and just were a little mm -hmm. electronic mm -hmm. and didn't weren't that different than, and they provided a huge market for the IBM yeah. 650, which was just barely a computer, and and that's what yeah. got IBM over the hump and you know helped yep. them make it to the, the to the next uh. yeah I think of your book as a really important entry in the kind of user driven innova innovation literature right yeah. like Eric Van Hippel right. who was probably your colleague at <laughs> yeah. MIT and just the idea that users are shaping what firms are doing right um, including MIT as you're saying yeah. yeah and and you know there were um, particular figures too that were incredibly important in this um hold for a second because i'm i'm having a i'm also losing my thing what's the name of the guy i can't believe i can't say his name <laughs> oh it's okay don't worry one second <laughs> the guy who wrote the the book about um the first popular book about computers ah mm. You, oh, like Wiener or no, nope. no, nope. no. He was an insurance guy. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I can't find him. We'll leave him out. Yeah. Sorry. It's all right. I'll let That's that okay. go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but uh, so the insurance industry uh, was very involved. They had, they worked with the the early computing companies to develop both applications. And um, the actual some of the hardware, you know, like they yeah. they were the ones who insisted on card to tape and tape to card converters because they wanted to be yeah. able to use their cards. They didn't want right. to give them up for magnetic tape. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they they insisted on that for the Univac, and they and the early six fifties didn't even have tape. They they were card based because insurance companies had these huge files of cards that they did everything with and yeah on a card you know it's material they can still see it it can't just disappear with a magnet yeah, yeah and they yeah, were nervous yeah. about <laughs> sure of magnetic course magnetic tape and, you know <laughs> they, they weren't ready be, yeah. to give those away <laughs> so you know they did have a big influence and yeah. it was it was very interesting to watch uh, when you get in to enough detail and the committees they set up all these committees they developed an archetypal, they, they developed a sort of, this is what we think most insurance companies are going to want as their first mm -hmm. application program, their first program. And IBM later turned it into a program and then and bundled it with computers for insurance. And, and that, mm -hmm. that um, bundled piece of software was key in getting, you know, even more insurance companies to buy those computers. Mm -hmm. So, um you know, it was, it, looking at it from the point of view of a user industry is really mm -hmm. fascinating. Totally. Like, looking at, at technology only from the uh, the inventor or the <laughs> developer side I know. loses all this. I know. I'm a use guy, so I'm an adoption and use guy yep. is my main Me thing. Me too. Yep. Me too. <laughs> I have definitely become that. You know, it's, it, it's uh, very, yeah. uh, very interesting. In fact, I... When I was president of the Business History Conference, I gave my presidential talk on use and uh, users okay. and use and how we should 
Um, I'm going to go back and look at that. Focus that sounds more like on you. I should be drumming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, there was too much not looking at you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is one. Of, yep. I have a whole soapbox <clears throat> dedicated to this. Uh, yes. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, I want to just flag, just flagging for grad students who will listen to this. I, I think, it, you know, someone should look into how structuration theory became useful to people looking at organizations during the, the 80s and 90s because it's not just Orlikowski. Steve Barley, the editor yeah. you mentioned, he's using it too. So someone should, really should go back and kind of mine like what people were finding useful about that theory at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have guesses, but... Yeah. For me, what was useful is that it, it helps understand both um, change and and stasis. You know, you can exactly. understand both. I can understand... How a genre stabilized, and then how how at a, a, a later point in time it started changing, changing again. Yeah. yeah, and and for me that was the the attraction. Yep. So where I want to you know I want to ask you about what you're up to now, but I want to talk about standards briefly. You wrote two, you know, you wrote a, a, a monograph with your husband Craig Murphy, who was a professor of political science at Wellesley, and then you did a a bigger, kind of pop, more popular book, Engineering Rules, Global Standard Setting Since 1880. Um, yeah, so tell us a bit, I mean, like, how'd you get onto standards? I'm, you know, I'm a standards nerd too, so we share, <laughs> this is probably how I, like, started working with you first. Uh, but how did, how'd you start working with Craig on it yeah. too? Is, is so, some, yeah. Um, for years, for decades, we've thought, um, we've said, sort of lightly, you know, one day we should find a topic and write something together. Because <laughs> yep. both of us take a historical angle on our fields. And, you know, he was in international relations and studies global governance, but he has always done historical things like he did a, a, a history of the UN development program and went out mm -hmm. and interviewed mm -hmm. all these field officers. And and he mm -hmm. did another on... Um, I mean, he's definitely had his his uh, his focus on history as well. So mm -hmm. it always seemed like a good idea, but we've never come up with a topic that, mm -hmm. you know, we'd occasionally toss out a topic and it was never really quite right. And I don't actually remember what brought this topic up, but when it popped up, it was, we both said, oh, hmm, mm -hmm. that's interesting. I, I've been joined yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There's a kitty in the photo for you yes. or, or for, in the video for those <laughs> doing audio. <laughs> yes, I just dumped her off. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, and, and the reason standards seemed reasonable from both points of view is that the standardization process, companies are very involved in it and it affects what they can do. They're users yeah. of standards too. But, this notion of global governance that Craig yep. has studied for a long time, this, the standards um, system is a mode of global mm -hmm. governance that's neither governmental nor um, market. Strictly private, yeah. Nor strictly private. Uh, well, it, mm -hmm. it is strictly private, but it's not, well, yes. Uh, yeah. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. It's private. I use the term private because it's non-governmental. Um, right. And so it's definitely non-governmental, but it's definitely, yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. So I think what the, the spectrum you're working with here is we can have things like the QWERTY keyboard that are decided strictly In by market. the market. That's right. Market and then here. you can have de jure standards yep. that are set by law. Right. And, and, and in between. We have these. Yeah. And in between. In between have, I'm looking at this world in between. Yep. <clears throat> and it's a huge world and one that hasn't been um, very well studied, mostly because, yeah. you know, political scientists look at the government side and and um, business people look at the business side right. and historians look at both the government and the business side, but hadn't looked that much at the standards, uh, the voluntary yeah. consensus standards. And that's what drives most of the standardization in this country. Totally. And well, and in the yeah. world now. In the world, yeah. In the globe, yeah. yeah. And so wh when we started thinking about that topic, we thought, okay, this is something that could be interesting and that we could definitely yeah. um, look at. And as we got into it, uh, we got into it from the historical side, um, but the, the, the short book uh, 
was was a response to a request from some of Craig's international relations colleagues to do a okay. short book focused just on the organization ISO. Got it. Um, and he was really the driver on that one. What uh, engineering rules was our um, our our aim all the way through having a big book on the history of mm-hmm. the um, standard setting process. This whole this whole world of standard setting mm-hmm. and how it evolved over time. And because no one had done that, I mean, people had looked at specific organizations, like there's a couple volumes on the ITU, the International right. Telecommunications <laughs> Union, which is not itself a standard setting body, by the way, but it has one it uses. Um, mm-hmm. It has a committee that has. Um, anyway, so we we thought, okay, this is something we can do, and we started on it um, before. Around 2005 or six, and then in 2007, I went into the dean's office at at Sloan. Oh, that's right. And from 2007 to 2012, I was like not doing. You were in dean land. I was in dean land. I was not doing <laughs> anything on research. So, you know, we yeah. had some of the the early research we had done on the the early parts, um, and some of that got incorporated into the into the short book, which is really, it, it has my name on it too, but really my piece of that one was quite small, um, mm-hmm. except that I got us going on the whole thing. But then the when I got out of Deanland and went to, I got uh, a year at the um, at CASBIS, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences in at Stanford, and dove back into the um, standards research Mm -hmm. and and that's what really got us back into the big book and and drove that through nice yeah i mean i thought it was it makes a lot of sense with your focus on users and you know the communications control through communications also about forms of standardization so in many ways it's a natural yeah i mean your your life i mean in the early stage the the control through communication talks about standards within companies Mm -hmm. this is you know, industry level standards mm-hmm. is what we're talking about in this. So, yeah, um, yeah it was, it's definitely uh, got connections. On the other hand, and I have written a separate paper that's in a edited book about mm-hmm. the genres of standardization, looking specifically cool. at genres of standardization. Um, but the book itself uh, doesn't, doesn't use the genre uh-huh. I need to read that paper. That sounds cool. That would be a yeah. I don't. I haven't bumped into that. It's one a book edited anything. by Bill Asprey. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, I was actually sort of stunned when he considers me a historian of computers, which I had never considered <laughs> myself. <laughs> I get why. I, that makes sense to me. And yeah. So I was like. Uh, Surprised and flattered when he <laughs> <laughs> considered me that. Um, Joanne, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I knew this would be fun, and, and it was. Well, I have really enjoyed talking to you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. You can reach us with questions, comments, and suggestions at Vinsel at gmail.com or by following me on Twitter at STS underscore news or on YouTube at People's Things. Our podcast is distributed by the New Books Network, the leading platform for academic podcasts, so that you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. People's and Things, like most things in this world, depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother, Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy, Juliana Castro, for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out her work at julianacastro.co. Joe Fort is the producer for the podcast, and Mandy Lamb is the production assistant. This podcast and other Peoples and Things programming are produced in affiliation with Virginia Tech Publishing and supported by the Center for Humanities and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. For information about other podcasts 
from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. For the entire Peoples and Things team, I am Lee Vinsel. And most importantly, I want to thank you for listening. Thanks.